This year, the 12th annual Steve Beaker Lecture, an event that the University of Cape Town community anticipates throughout the year, was delivered by internationally renowned advocate Sir Sidney Kentridge. This lecture is held each year in honor of activist Steve Biko, who died on 12 September 1977. Sir Sidney delivered the lecture titled Evil Under the Sun, The Death of Steve Biko, to a packed Jamison Hall. Nkosinati Biko, the Chief Executive Officer of the Steve Biko Foundation, gave a brief background on the work of the foundation. This, of course, is the 12th Steve Biko Memorial Lecture, a lecture that is now one of the oldest lectures in the new South Africa. The lecture and the partnership with UCT has brought to this city an impressive array of speakers. It's a celebration of freedoms unknown in yesteryears, freedom of thought and the freedom of expression. And most importantly, and in the tradition of Steve Biko, it's intended to get us to talk, but going beyond just talk, also to get us to use our citizenship as agency. UCT's Vice Chancellor, Dr. Max Price, introduced Sir Sidney, but not before underlining the significance of this lecture in the face of the Protection of Information Bill that was meant to come before Parliament the following week. Imagine if it was present-day South Africa, and all the information about Biko's death had been classified, as it would have been, by the intelligence agency, which under the law, under the bill, is certainly allowed to classify such information. As journalist Brendan Boyle points out, Biko's close friend, the Daily Dispatch editor Donald Woods, would not have had the protection of a public interest defense with, the, with, with this bill in its current form and would have been convicted. This also affects academics in a special way. Researchers often work with classified material, contemporary or archival. They usually sign confidentiality agreements in order to access such information, such material. But not infrequently, they find things there that ought to be exposed and acted upon. The confidentiality agreements they sign do not require, for example, that they conceal criminal activity. But in the absence of a public interest clause, those academics would, would be prevented from revealing anything. Now it is easy to feel despondent that after a year of campaigning and public debates, we are still facing a draconian anti-democratic bill that looks like it is going to be railroaded through parliament by a dominant party. But that would be a mistake. And it would fail to recognize the significant successes of, the civil, of civil society campaigns, and in fact the responsiveness of the ANC to those reasonable arguments. So we must declare our, that we welcome these changes and we congratulate those who have been campaigning for them as well as those with the power and insight to make those changes who have made them. Kentridge began his lecture with an account of the events that led to the death of Steve Biko. Despite his unemotional and factual documentation of the political leader's death, the trauma, abuse and injustice of the pain and torture that Steve Biko suffered could not be masked. He was sent to Pretoria prison and by the morning he was dead. <coughs> there was never any doubt even before the inquest began of the true cause of death. The story of a hunger strike was simply a clumsy fabrication. The cause of death was extensive brain damage caused by blows to the head. The pathologists, all of them, those employed by the state and those engaged by the Biko family agreed on this. So what were the issues at the inquest? First, the police denied throughout that Biko had been assaulted. Consequently, much of the police evidence was directed to finding some cause for his brain injuries which did not incriminate them. The second issue was the manner in which Steve Biko was treated throughout his detention. On the first issue, there was a story to which all the officers uh, ad adhered as best they could. On the morning of the 7th, was that, this was the evidence, 
Biko was taken from the mat on which he'd lain under, at night under guard and in shackles and was taken to the investigation room. There he was seated on a chair and when the major who was in charge of the investigation began to question him, he sprang up and attacked the major with such fury that it took a captain who was also present and three other officers to subdue him. In the course of this violent struggle, it was said, he must have bumped his head on the wall and fallen to the floor. But he was fighting furiously throughout. And after he was brought under control, he was taken back to the mat where he was again placed in leg irons. He said despite the extensive evidence that Biko was tortured, shackled and stripped naked, the presiding chief magistrate's verdict was that no one was responsible for his death. Given the history of previous inquests, previous inquests into the deaths of detainees, the verdict, perverse as it was, was by no means a surprise to us, by that I mean to counsel in the case. To quote Ecclesiastes again, if thou seest the oppression of the poor and the violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, marvel not at the matter. But many did marvel. The verdict caused outrage in South Africa and well beyond. It flew in the face of all the evidence. Its formal result was to exonerate all the officers from the colonel downwards. They were not disciplined or even reprimanded for the manner in which they treated Biko after he'd suffered his injuries. On the contrary, the colonel was promoted to brigadier and in due course so was the captain. In our closing address to the court we said this, any verdict which can be seen as an exoneration of the Port Elizabeth security police will unfortunately be interpreted as a license to abuse helpless people with impunity. Unfortunately, we were right. Over the following 10 years, more than 30 people died while in detention by the security branch or having passed through their hands. Throughout the lecture and even in the press conference afterwards, Sir Sidney was loath to comment on the Protection of Information Bill, saying he had not read it, but he did reiterate that the state should have no secrets. Government secrets, yes, every government's got secrets. You try to, try to keep them. But to make it criminal to reveal what the government would like to be kept secret is absolutely fatal because, as I said, every government in the world would like to keep its things secret, its, its private matters secret. But democracy means that you can't keep it secret and you shouldn't. And I, that's why I think that what happened to Biko was the, uh, to detainees generally, was the exact thing about it. You kept it secret. They either kept it secret by other means then, but keeping ill keeping this ill-doing secret is, is fatal. First it might be just some minor secret, then there's another one, and finally you'll find that the press cannot, cannot uh, write about wrongdoing in the government. You know in England now, there are constantly leaks to the press of confidential government documents. And of course the government